Welcome to the sixth annual John T. Washington Lecture Series. So, I have a dissertation here, even though I know I'm not the main speaker, but we will get through this. Okay? First of all, I want to really thank all of you all for being here at this time of the day. And I particularly would like to thank a few individuals who are here you know, to make this possible. Our Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities, Dean Moore, thank you. <laughs> Our Vice Provost and Dean of the College of Undergraduate Studies, Dean Berry, thank you. I want to thank Dean, Associate Dean Froby, for all your support, for your contributions, along with my chair, <laughs> Satcher, for all your support and for being here. And where is my Chanel Lewis? She is the Black Student Union President, and I appreciate your support. Who's going to dinner with you? Are you two in shirts? Oh, okay. To matching outfits, all right? <laughs> um, is Professor Nancy Stanwick here? I think something yeah, came up and she's unable to be here. And I'm not sure, I hope I mentioned everyone, but seriously, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because without your support, it would make it very difficult. But in particular, I want to thank the Department of History, particularly, and I'm going to, I know he's the chair of our department, but I'm going to say, especially the president of the History Department, which is Dr. John Satcher, <laughs> and his chief of staff. Is Sarah here? No. Okay. You know, Sara is the administrator coordinator. coordinator. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, Jesse, who's over here, is our program coordinator, along with, is it Catalina? And Catalina, who is our administrative assistant that I'm calling President Satcher's staff you know, his cabinet or whatever, you know, but the reason why I'm saying this is because this is my first event of doing this, and the history department has really been excellent in walking me through this because I was told by my former chair, Dr. Lawson, Dean Lawson, that I'll be doing this this year, but I really want to thank you, Jesse, because while the department really walk me through this process. You took my hand with baby steps, you know, to really get me through this. So this is a lot of work. So <laughs> second thing I want to talk about briefly, particularly for the students or folks who may not know who Dr. John T. Washington was, I think it's important to mention um, something about that big face, that, that mural that's on one of the buildings. One of the buildings is named John T. Washington. There's a scholarship in his name. And of course, here I am talking about a lecture series in his name. Now, I didn't have the privilege of knowing him personally, but based on what I read about him and what others have told me about him, I kind of like feel like I know him. The mentoring he did with students, he's the kind of professor who is what I call a student's first professor. Based on what I understood, I'm not sure whether he was the first African-American professor or one of the few African-American professors here, but my understanding is, I know he was here during a time when even the minority 
of black students were a small number here. And sometimes when you are a few in numbers, you know, you may feel a little alienated, excluded, left out, down. And from what I understood, it was Dr. Washington who was the one who would embrace these students. He was the one who would make certain that these students didn't feel misplaced or lonely. And of course, he went on and did other things. He's a Floridian. He earned his undergrad and his graduate degrees here in Florida. He was instrumental early on in UCF in terms of building the Office of Equal Opportunity, Affirmative Action, Office of Multicultural Support. He did volunteer work in the community. He even founded a church and was a pastor and a counselor at the church. I wanted to give you those tidbits because our speaker tonight, Dr. Lewis Brogdon, he reminds me a lot of Dr. Washington in terms of things that you've done. So, a little bit about Dr. Brogdon, our Washington lecturer for this year. I met him about 10 years ago at a small private black college in South Carolina. He was still rather a green, new PhD person. I think he's had it three or four years at the time that I met him. But the three things I remember most about Dr. Brogdon, I will always see him sitting under a tree reading with a stack of books. I will see students sit down with him and they will be engaged in some kind of conversation. I was impressed. The second thing I was impressed with and I remember by him was his intellectualism to the point where I reached out to administration and we brought him in to work as a part-time lecturer teaching in the Department of Humanities. But once we saw how students flocked to his classes, once we saw how more and more students wanted to major a minor in that area, we knew that we had a real young scholar on our hands. But see, the third thing that I remember most about Dr. Brogdon was his hog washing skills. Okay, hogs, you know, pigs. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about that. You see, the HBCU we were at, they raised their own cows and pigs and chickens and vegetables to supplement to feed the students. I didn't know this at the time, but Dr. Brogdon, Brogdon, in spite of his PhD and his working on his book, he was hired to be the full-time hog washer. Well, why is that important? If you know anything about hogs, they play in the dirt, they get wet, because they love mud. So they're dirty, they're filthy, they're smelly. But once they went to Dr. Broaden's hog washing treatment, by the time they were finished, their skin was like a light pink, almost white. They smelled good. He even brushed their teeth. And that's the truth. Everybody knew on campus that he was his hog washer, and he was great. <clears throat> However, I knew him as someone who was more than a hog washer. He was an intellectual. He was a student-oriented type person. He was like the Pied Piper. I don't know if you remember the Pied Piper, the person who uh, played the music and all the children were following. So I saw Dr. Brogdon as being this Pied Piper and a hidden 
scholar. So what I did, I reached out again to the administration, and we hired him in our department as an assistant professor full time, and the department just rocked because so many students took his courses, so many minors, majors. He was great. However, he got a call one day from administration because he's talented and they wanted to see if he would consider maybe working part time as the hog washer. They would double his wages. At this time, Dr. Broadlin had gotten a little uppity from being a professor, and he made it very clear to the administration, heck to the no. He then resigned. He went to Kentucky at Simmons College, where he took an administrative position. At the same time, they still need that hog washer, so they looked at me. And I just told them, if you think he's ugly, I'm up a turf, and he's nice. He said, heck to the no, but I'm saying H-E-L-L -L to the no. Then I left, and I went to Boston, and I worked up there. And why am I telling you all this? One thing that Dr. Brogdon is very proud of is that he does have that new MTV show coming out. And the show is called The Battle of the Hogwashes, and he wants to invite all of you all to apply. Mm -hmm. With this scholar, today, he has become a very respected associate professor of preaching and black church studies. He has served in different positions as a chair, as a dean, even as a provost, academic, um, what is it, um, uh, vice president of academics. However, what I like most about him is that he is a serious scholar. He's authored several books. He has written several articles. He has done book chapters. He's given service to his profession with many book reviews, presentations like he's going to give today. And he's also been engaged in the community. Community service is very important. He's even been successful in grant writing in order to promote either his institute or his own scholarship. The thing is, is that with Dr. Brogdon, because I was, this is my first John T. Washington lecture, I really wanted to bring someone here who I think could relate to the work of John T. Washington. Also, he's an expert when it comes to black religious studies, and he's going to talk about um, one of his icons today, Dr. Martin Luther King. But I want everyone to give a warm welcome to our J.T. Washington lecturer and hog washer. Um, <laughs> a warm round of applause. <laughs> oh, and that was a lie, by the way. So don't go Googling him. He's not a hog washer. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, it is such an honor and a privilege to share a few moments with you talking about a topic that is so near and dear to my heart. I have such admiration for the life and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And every opportunity I get February is always a busy time if you are a Black Studies scholar. I am usually here 
they're everywhere. But each opportunity I am afforded to talk about Dr. King, it is a true gift. And so on behalf of our president, faculty, and the Institute for Black Church Studies, where I serve as the executive director, I send you greetings from uh, the Bluegrass State, home of uh, horses, bourbon, and great scholars. <laughs> I want to express my profound gratitude for the opportunity to deliver this year's lecture to the dean, associate dean, various members of the administration, to my good friend, Dr. Max Sheldon. Uh, thank you all so much for inviting me. I don't know how you all pulled off this coup uh, to woo her from the Northeast down here to Orlando, but kudos to you when we were in the same department uh, at Clapham University. The institutions were always ringing her bell, reaching out to her, uh, trying to pull her away. It was a real gift be able to share an office suite with her. And for her to watch me grow my department way faster than the history department. Uh, ha, ha, ha. She left that part out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope, I hope her. It was, it, was a, it was a wonderful time during those years. And so it is, I haven't seen you in so long, and so it is a gift to be able to, uh, to see you again. And I know that you are going to do outstanding work here. Before I begin tonight's talk, uh, it is Black History Month, and I do want to express my gratitude to university leadership for creating space for black studies. Uh, I am a huge advocate for both HBCUs as very, very important spaces in the African American community. They've served such a pivotal and important role in our history. But after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, and you had the, the whole growth of black studies, where you get black-centric thought in what we call PWIs, predominantly white institutions. They're usually called African American Studies, Africana Studies, Pan-African Studies. Uh, and so it is good that this university values and respects the Black Studies tradition because it is so important. I ended my afternoon lecture uh, talking about the Dr. King they don't tell us about. And one of the things about Dr. King that has been lost in our public discourse is the influence of the black intellectual tradition on Dr. King. And if we want our colleges and universities to produce students like a Dr. King, then it is so important that they get a rigorous, substantive engagement with black intellectualism. So thank you for the opportunity to continue to nurture the important work that you all taking up here in the city of Orlando. Tonight's lecture, I want to do three, three moves in my talk tonight. I want to open talking a little bit about uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. I will then pivot to talk about King's dream becoming a nightmare. I stumbled upon this teaching, of course, on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at my alma mater. One of the wonderful things I get to do as a Black Studies scholar is to not only develop Black Studies programs for predominantly white institutions, I get to teach courses. And when you're a professor, you know there's a lot we know, but then there's what we're learning while we're teaching. And I stumbled upon this truth that Dr. King said his dream became a nightmare. And you know, I was really engaged during the lecture, you know, asking my students, you know, why don't we know this? You know, did you know this? Because on the inside, I was like, I didn't know this. Uh, I'm going to talk about Dr. King telling the country that his dream became a nightmare. 
And then my final move will then be to talk about the problems with Dr. King's dream as the chief symbol and organizing motif for his work. And if King told us his dream became a nightmare, why are we still looking at Dr. King as just a dream? So I want to add some complexity and depth to our understanding and appreciation for Dr. King. Now let's see if the clicker is ready. Yes. One of the great joys of being a Black Studies scholar during the months of January and February is, you know, folks, there's lots of interest in Dr. King. Third Monday of, uh, of the month in January, we celebrate Dr. King's birthday. It is a federal holiday. We then roll into the month of February. It's Black History Month. Lots of opportunities to recognize the contributions of African Americans. I had to take a break from social media back in 2020. There was there were a lot of things going on. You you may remember. <laughs> But every month during February, all over social media, you're always getting the clips of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, hearing politicians, entertainers, athletes, stumbling over themselves, trying to talk substantively about someone they know very little about. So when you ask Americans, what do you know about Dr. King's legacy? So many allude to this wonderful speech that Dr. King gave uh, in 1963 uh, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Have you had an opportunity to visit the Lincoln Memorial and to see the place where they marked where he was standing when he gave the speech? How many have had that opportunity? It's, it's pretty powerful. What a lot of people don't know is the NAACP at the beginning of 1963 launched a campaign and the campaign was called Free by 63. And so the March on Washington was almost a culminating event of work being done in black communities all over the country. You will hear the language in King's speech that after a hundred years since the Emancipation Proclamation, Black people are still not, not free. Now this speech is one of the moments in U.S. history. Speeches uh, celebrate, recognize, in a lot of introduction to uh, public speaking courses, this speech is alluded to, referenced. It was a powerful moment. The nation watched Dr. King deliver this moving speech. King and leaders of SCLC spent the morning in the White House, then went out and King told the nation about this wonderful dream that he had. Now what's interesting is what Americans remember about this dream. There are parts of the dream that we remember, but there are parts of his speech that we've completely forgotten. I mean, for example, King opens up basically saying, 100 years since Emancipation Proclamation, black people are still not free. So that point gets completely lost in public discourse about Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. What was one of the first things Dr. King said with this? He was saying, it's been a hundred years since Lincoln gave this and black people are still not free. The March on Washington was the march for jobs and freedom. Okay. They're, they're, they're marching so that they can enjoy the rights promised to them 100 years ago at the time. So a lot of times in our public discourse, that's a piece that just gets completely dropped. I love the language of the speech where he says, 100 years later, the 
Negro languishes on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of an ocean of material prosperity. I mean, <laughs> that is, that is an incredible image. That 100 years later, the Negro finds himself uh, isolated in his own land. I mean, he, he paints such a powerful picture. When people talk about the I Have a Dream speech, that's something that is kind of forgotten. We also forget, we forget the parts of the speech where King says, we've come to cash a check. <laughs> come to hold this country uh, accountable. And then as you get further into the speech, he gives very, very strong language that we can't be satisfied with basically an unjust status quo. So what's ironic is that the parts of the speech um, that, that have real teeth, re real challenge, those are the parts the country <coughs> has chosen to, to ignore when they talk about celebrating uh, this great man and this great this great civil rights leader and icon. We, we sort of forget about that. Ah, but what do we remember? We remember the parts of the speech where he talks about little children holding hands, experiencing brotherhood and sisterhood. We, we love the part of the speech where they won't be judged by the color of their skin. I wish I had a nickel for every time I've heard a politician take that phrase from the speech. We want to be a country that you know judges people by the content of their character. And that would be nice <laughs> uh, if, if that was the kind of country we were really working towards. So, very interesting juxtaposition that number one, when it comes to this speech, which is so very important. It's interesting to pay attention to the parts we ignore versus the parts of the speech we, we choose to remember. Uh, Dr. Lonnie Birch is a, one of my favorite historians. and He once said you can tell a lot about a country by what it chooses to remember. He also says you can tell a lot about a country by what it chooses to forget. It was such a wonderful moment, though. Don't want to minimize the, the significance of that, that march, that speech. King was heralded Man of the Year. Was it long after that you had the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 64? King is awarded the Nobel Prize next year. It's a beautiful thing. It had the world recognizing that, that something was happening in America. Laws were being changed. It's a very, very powerful image of King shaking hands with President Johnson. But it didn't take long before the dream started to die. Three weeks, three weeks, not a month, not two months, three weeks after King gives this speech, four young African American girls are, are murdered at the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, and 11-year-old Cynthia Wesley. They were killed. Addie's sister Sarah survived, but she lost her eye. Dr. King was asked to deliver the eulogy uh, for these, these young girls. And while history reports that this was a real tragedy, it's Coretta's autobiography that really gives us a window into just how simple that moment was for her 
and Martin. You start hearing Martin in the words of his eulogy, beginning to sour on America. He says in his eulogy, these children, unoffending, innocent, and beautiful, were the victims of one of the most vicious, heinous crimes ever perpetrated against humanity. Now that can sound a bit excessive. Oh, he's just using flowery language. Surely he doesn't believe that there's anything significant about the deaths of these four black girls. Um, uh, no. It stood out in his mind. He says, they died nobly. They are the martyr heroines of a holy crusade for freedom and human dignity. So they have something to say to us in their death. <laughs> okay. And then he starts to call the roll. And, and in the black preaching tradition, we call this stepping on toes. Uh, and, the, and the black preacher, when he wants to step on toes, he says, I'm stepping on toes and I got big feet. In other words, uh, everyone's going to share in the criticism. And so King issues a national rebuke of the country that even includes the black community. He says, their death says to us that we must work passionately and unrelentingly to make the American dream a reality so they did not die in vain. Ah, but what Coretta reports, before he got to that eulogy, that that event had a devastating effect on him. That it caused serious pause. And you're going to hear Martin allude to some of this in a clip that I'm going to show in a few moments. When I teach courses on Dr. King, I love making my students read Coretta's autobiography because Coretta was more than just a loving and supportive wife who was, you know, at home tending to the kids while you know, Martin the man is out changing the world. No, as Martin is thinking through these complex and hard issues, Coretta was an intellectual partner in every sense of the word. Helping him write and correct and sharpen his speeches. Being an important support and sounding board. Traveling with him, engaging with leaders, and then of course, after Dr. King's death, Coretta becomes one of the leaders uh, in the civil rights movement. So getting, requiring students, making them actually engage with her and her work is a very, very important part uh, of a course on King. But Coretta reported that they had underestimated the virulent depths of white hatred. It's going to be very interesting to hear how, how Dr. King characterizes this uh, in just a few moments. You go into 64 and you get the whole long, hot summer of 64. And in black studies, we, we often talk about when you study black history, you have these moments of progress, these moments of breakthrough. It's beautiful. It's glorious. Something big happens. But it's always met, always met, always met with backlash. You take two steps forward, and then there's the backlash. And sometimes the backlash is often pushing you three steps back. It is really hard to make progress when it's two steps forward, three steps back. And you get the passage of the Civil Rights Act, you get you know, an African American getting the Nobel Peace, you know, uh, Peace Prize. African American is is the Man of the Year on Time Magazine, being celebrated. Well, that wakes up some demons in America. Sixty-four, the Klan sort of reasserts themselves. The riots in urban centers. I mean, nineteen sixty, the summer of sixty-four it was a hot, hot time. A lot going on. So what's happening between 
You have King giving his speech in August. Three weeks later, you get the bombing. Lots of positive things are going on. You get into 64, the nation is embroiled in controversy. There is this undercurrent, and it's beginning to impact Dr. King. So if you study King's writings, you study his thought, 55 once the Montgomery bus boycott kicks off, you will notice there is a tone of optimism. Because, I mean, think about what they accomplished with the Montgomery bus boycott. That's one of the miracles of modern history. You got the, the black community in its entirety to all get on the same page and cooperate. And we're not going to ride buses, we're going to walk, we're going we're gonna to figure out how to make it work. Uh, and that was the beginning of this, this beautiful and powerful movement. And because of that, you know, he writes Strive Toward Freedom. There's this optimistic tone in his speeches. That starts to change, 63 through 68. King becomes more radical in, these, in, the, in the years 63 through 68. You notice he starts to sour. Uh, on America. Oh, good, yeah, from back there. And I have pretty decent eyes. I'm like, I hope the print, it, the print looks good there. Um, so, 63 through 68, he becomes very, very critical of, of America. He spent a lot of time talking about the American dream, and this, this language begins to, to shift. In fact, he will shift and start talking about the dream he had actually died. And you'll see him engaged in what I describe as a prophetic dance with hope and despair. So here's some homework from Professor Brockton. Uh, if you have uh, the, the app Max, it used to be HBO Max, now they switched it to Max. It's a big old blue emblem. You, all right, watch the documentary, King in the Wilderness. Oh, 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 it is good. Really, really good. If you want to get into those years and really engage with just how hard it was for Dr. King to keep hope during those final years. Because you, you will recall the image of Dr. King from the opening slide. It wasn't a cheery image of Dr. King. It was, it was someone who, had, who was carrying a heaviness about him. King became more radical in these final years, often challenging the country. Why is there so much poverty in a country that's swelling with incredible affluence? So he shifts his focus from racism to the poor people's campaign because here's a point in his thinking that even though he is becoming more radical, this is still the point in his thinking where he's being very, very inclusive. But it's about coalitions between all poor people because we're all in it together. That, that many of the white Americans so opposed to the work that he was doing in the movement we're economically no better off than the black people <laughs> who, were, who, were, who were taking up the work of the civil rights movement. He was trying to help them to understand that these broader systems are disenfranchising all of us. And he shifted to dealing with issues of economic inequality. And it's funny that Dr. King is talking about this in the late 60s. I'll give you this one for free. It's one of the wonderful things I get to do as a black studies professor is I'm doing advisory work for the United Nations. And the UN has an initiative called the Permanent Forum for People of African Descent, where they are looking at uh, how people of African descent are being treated all over the world. And we're trying to find ways to, to partner together. The United Nations issued a, a report just a few years ago of just how many millions of, of Americans are living in poverty. 
And guess what? The number is it's about 45 million. And of the 45 million Americans living in poverty, about 18 of those are living in abject poverty. The report described they're living in third world conditions right here in this country. And this is some of the this is exactly what King was trying to help the country to see years ago. And you hear it in speeches like the speech talking about Negroes are not moving too fast. Because it's like, hey, now you've got the Civil Rights Act of 64. Yeah, okay, now y'all slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Stop, stop, stop trying to push too hard. And, and King is like, no. Look at the conditions African Americans are living in. Think things just because that one piece of legislation was passed does not mean the kingdom has come. And he basically pushes back that you know African Americans are just going to accept uh, equality on the majority culture's terms. Uh, so you start seeing him really pushing back. He's like. Uh, Negro people are, you know, we expect to sort of live out our lives in rural and urban slums, silent and apathetically. King was like, wrong. We're not going to do that. We're, we're going to keep pushing. The history class got to watch a little uh, excerpt from a speech that King gave in 67. We know about his first march on Washington. King was planning another march on Washington in the late 60s. And that second march, he says, we are coming to get our check. <laughs> okay. That's a little different than the king having the dream that we're all going to hold hands, sit down at the table of brotherhood. He said, no, the federal government gave millions of acres of land to our white sisters and brothers, then built land grant colleges, then gave them low interest with no interest loans so that they can then mechanize and build a whole farm again. And the exact same time you're doing this, you're denying African Americans the same things you're doing for our white sisters and brothers. What was happening during these years, his dream was becoming a nightmare. And he told the country this on multiple occasions, but I want you to watch uh, a particular clip of this, because this, he tells it, uh, May of 67, in an NBC News interview. Let's watch this together. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I must confess that uh, that dream that I had that day has at many points turned into a nightmare. Now, I'm not one to lose hope. I keep on hoping. Uh, I still have faith in the future. But I've had to analyze many things over the last few years, and I would say over the last few months. I've gone through a lot of soul-searching and agonizing moments, and I've come to see that uh, we have uh, many more difficult days ahead, and some of the old optimism was a little superficial, and now it must be tempered with a solid realism. And I think the realistic fact is that we still have a long, long way to go and that we are involved in a war on Asian soil, uh, which, if not checked and stopped, can poison the very soul of our nation. I'm not going to say that all of our problems will be solved if the war in Vietnam is ended, but I do say that the war makes it infinitely more difficult to deal with these problems. Uh, when a nation becomes obsessed with the guns of war, uh, it loses its social perspective, and programs of social uplift suffer. This is just a, a fact of history, so that we do face many more difficulties uh, as a result of the war. It's much more difficult to really arouse a conscience during a time of war. 
There is something about a war like this that makes people insensitive. It dulls a conscience. It strengthens the forces of reaction. And it brings into being bitterness and hatred and violence. I think the biggest problem now is that we got our gains over the last 12 years at bargain rates, so to speak. It uh, didn't cost the nation anything. In fact, it helped the economic side of the nation to integrate lunch counters and public accommodations. It didn't cost the nation anything uh, to get uh, the right to vote established. And now we are confronting issues that cannot be solved without costing the nation billions of dollars. Now, I think this is where we're getting our greatest resistance. They may put it on many other things, but we can't get rid of slums and poverty without it costing the nation something. It's first startling statement uh, he is making here. And it's not the first time he's made those statements. When he was preaching at, at Ebenezer on Christmas Eve, he revealed to the church that his dream started to die back in 63 with the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. See, America, we love talking about Dr. King's dream. But we ignore the nightmare. Listen to some of the language from the excerpt you just watched. King, using religious language, says he must confess. That's religious language. In other words, as hard as it is for him to do this, he has to be honest. The language of confession, that's, that's religious language of, of, of burying your soul. And he's burying his soul to the nation. He says his dream has turned into a nightmare. He invoked language of going through soul searching and agonizing moments. That's what was happening 63, 64, 65, 66, 67 and concludes that we have many more difficult days ahead. You will hear that statement in speeches King is giving a lot in 67 and 68. He starts saying, we have difficult days ahead. You don't hear all the optimism. You don't hear, oh, it's getting ready to happen. No, he starts to see, no, we've got some difficult days. We'll eventually get to something better. Not right now. And I love the point where he talked about the problem that they're facing with the Poor People's Campaign is again, you have to get buy-in. And that's where all the white progressives who came down to March in 63 and 64, they started to turn on him. Because sure, they didn't want the police beating on African Americans. They wanted African Americans to be able to vote, but they didn't want to live close to them. They didn't care if they were in ghettos and slums. And they definitely didn't want to inconvenience themselves. So King makes some powerful points. You know what happens. He is assassinated April the 4th, 1968. That is such a powerful image of, of his wife, Coretta. So as I pivot, why does this matter? Well, I think it matters because Carl Wendell Hines wrote a poem about Malcolm, about Malcolm X that, <laughs> that ended up being prophetic because it's exactly what was going to happen as it relates to the legacy of Dr. King. He says, dead men make such convenient heroes because they cannot rise to challenge the images that we would make of them. You know, and that set the stage for kind of what ends up happening in this country. Now the king is dead. We'll tell everyone he was a great man, even though the FBI said he was the most dangerous man in America. Here's someone that's leading a nonviolent movement. 
who while he is preaching a sermon, someone walks up and punches him, he does nothing. Someone stabs him, almost kills him, he does nothing. This man is the most dangerous man in America. Dr. King was not very popular in 67 and 68 in America, getting significant pushback. But now that he's dead, oh, we name roads after him, we name schools, we have the King Monument in D.C. Who's been to the King Monument in D.C.? Oh, it's a movie. It, it's, yeah, it's powerful. And of course we have MLK Day, third Monday in January. Now Americans, they do appreciate Dr. King, but the acknowledgement lacks context, depth, and complexity. A lot of times his ideas are misrepresented, leaving Americans with a sort of naive, flat, simplistic view of a complex man living during complicated times. We never ask the question, what forces in America killed his dream. Teach Dr. Brogdon, I'm doing the best I can. That's the question. But when we create this caricature, oh, he was a, he had a dream, and, and today, look, Obama, he was president. That was Dr. King's dream, see? But it's different when you have to say, what killed this man's dream? Because it was a powerful dream he talked about. Which leads me to the problems I have when we just make the dream, the, the central, the chief symbol of organizing motif of his work. Well, you have to go back and do a little history. It was Jimmy Carter who wanted to find ways for the country to honor Dr. King. And a national conversation ensued about Dr. King's legacy, And one of the things that helped make honoring Dr. King palatable was to focus on the language at the end of the speech of little black children and little white children holding hands together. That ended up saying, let's forget about all that other stuff. Let, let's focus on this, and that helped the country to at least say, okay, let, let's honor this person who was assassinated well over a decade ago. So, so it's very, very problematic that even when we, that in, in, in order to get Americans to say, let's respect and show some appreciation, we have to create this, this caricature, this myth, this lie of Dr. King. And then you get Reagan, who's, you know, who signs the bill, and I mean, if this statement just takes the cake. Reagan says, uh, traces of bigotry still more America, that is true. So each year on MLK Day, let us not only recall Dr. King, uh, but, you know, he draws attention to the words, <laughs> thou shalt love thy God with all thy heart, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Dr. King didn't say that. Uh, Jesus said that. <laughs> okay. okay, so if we're, if we're honoring Dr. King, maybe a quote from something Dr. King actually said or wrote would have been, been appropriate versus, yeah, I mean, yeah, Dr. King said that, didn't he? Didn't even know. So that, that already lets you know that it's not genuine appreciation. So there are sort of four big problems I have as a scholar as it relates to this caricature of Dr. King as a dreamer. And why it's so important for people to study King. The first thing we do is we lift King out of historical context. We don't talk about what was going on in history when King said something. Because if you can make a connection between, okay, Dr. King said this, what was going on then? 
then that adds context. So then you know what you're quoting. You know why it's important. You know the connection between then and now. But to just pull a quote out of context, are we talking late 50s? Are we talking early 60s? Are we talking 60s, 60s? They have no idea. So King gets lifted out of context. King is not viewed as an intellectual. When you study the American intellectual tradition, King is completely left out of that. Wait a minute, why? King has a PhD in systematic theology. There are volumes and volumes and volumes of materials of his writings. Have you seen the King papers? King's an intellectual. King should be studied in every college, in every university in the United States of America. We de-radicalize King, and then we even lie about the dream. It is problematic to make King's I Have a Dream speech paradigmatic of his thought. He told the nation he had a dream, and he told the nation his dream became a nightmare. We ignore the latter message, opting for an excerpt of an earlier message. And I think the implications are significant. Having this, this caricature, this, this naive view of Dr. King doesn't really help us to understand him as a historical person, and it doesn't help us to take up the important work we have to do in this country. Grappling with both his dream and his nightmare forces us to ask the kind of questions that give sober and clear analyses of the systems and the depth of opposition we will expect on every hand. You all know everything that was happening in this country in 2020. From the moment they started protesting for the murder of George Floyd, every week for months, I was either on a panel, doing a webinar, speaking somewhere. It was a conversation happening all over the place. And it was, it was nice to see so many white sisters and brothers listening. We thought we might do something with this moment. Major companies, philanthropic organizations started making major donations into HBCUs. Black Lives Matter started to get some real traction in the country. Federal government decided Juneteenth is going to be a federal holiday. Guess what? Ever since 2020, here comes the backlash. Here comes the pushback that we're, we are still feeling to this day. But now that I understand King's nightmare, it helps me to make sense of the challenges that we face today. In fact, one of the last things I'm going to leave with you when you all offer courses on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. here, <coughs> Dr. Max Shelton. Every student should have to read this book. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community. And he pretty much knew, he knew the path we were on. He says, we're either going to learn how to live together as brothers or we are going to perish together as fools. Dr. King gets killed and America decided, hey, we want chaos because look what has engulfed and enveloped this nation. And he warned us. He warned us about white resistance to economic inequality. He warned us about disorganized black power. That you can't get black leaders on the same page. You can't galvanize us around a focused black agenda. That you got this organization, that organization, this one organization here is mismanaging funds. He saw all that. And that if we don't address these fundamental issues of economic inequality, all we're going to do is unleash chaos on ourselves. 
King told us about that in 67. So, my final thought is, where do we go from here? I believe we can get back to Dr. King's dream. But it is only, only, only if we are willing to face the forces that took his dream and killed him. And if we're willing to do that hard work and to face Dr. King's nightmare, then I think as a country we can find a path to dream again. Thank you. teach about the, the legacy of slavery, I point to two fundamental things. You have dehumanization and exploitation. And that a lot of times when we're talking about whether slavery, whether we're talking about institutional racism, a lot of the attention goes to the, you know, the whole legacy of dehumanization. People of African descent are not as intelligent as or the, 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 the whippings and the beatings, whether it's from slave masters, whether it's from police during the black codes, you, you name it. What doesn't get talked about is the economic exploitation piece. Because slavery is about the money, folks. It's about the Benjamins. Uh, and you, you're able to generate a tremendous amount of wealth because you have cheap and free labor. Uh, and all the founding fathers, except one, they, they were all able, because they were they owned slaves, they were able to amass wealth, leverage that wealth, to then become the very, very folks writing the founding documents of this country. Uh, so it gets baked into the cake. And King was trying to help folks to kind of get back to that, that at the fundamental level, we're all in this together, and we actually can do something better than we've done but a lot of people stand to lose and thrive on a country with chaos. Because as long as you get working class and poor people fighting with each other, they'll never create the kind of change. Um, and we just can't seem to get past that. Great, great points. Love your thinking. What's your major? Uh, criminal justice with a minor in writing career. Excellent, excellent. Yes? Um, so, I just wanted to ask, like, how important do you think propaganda is when it comes to all this? Because, like, for example, like, I, 
I'm not sure if it was that kind of rebellion, but it was like, it was an early slave rebellion where it was uh, poor whites and like slaves that were rebelling against like slave masters because they were like, oh yeah, well, they're poor and they're working together. Yep. And so, and the same thing with like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He's like, like what you said, he becomes too radicalized. And, like with Malcolm X, he, he, I only heard about him in high school, like my junior year. I never even really knew about him until then. And he just gets thrown as like a talk boy. He's like, oh, he was against Mark, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But nobody ever talks about how they were like, really close and they talked about multiple things. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Man, I tell you, you all are making your professors very proud with, with just, just uh, fantastic uh, analyses. I'll start with the Malcolm piece that it's very, very interesting to see where Malcolm starts and how his thinking shifts over time. Because he moves out of the nation of Islam and when he goes to Mecca, uh, he moves to a more expansive, more inclusive kind of mindset. So it's interesting, Malcolm starts off very militant. A uh, young white lady comes and says, what can I do to be a part of this? And he says, nothing in his early militant. Now he changes on that and, be, and becomes a, a, a broader, more universal thinking. King starts off very, very optimistic. And when, you know, uh, Malcolm was very critical of King in, in, in his early years. But then they sort of, Pass each other. And of course, at points when Malcolm is at the, the White House and things, and you know, I mean, Martin is at the White House, you know, Malcolm is showing up, listening, observing, kind of softening his stance on what King was doing. And, and King is the one who is becoming more radical the older he gets. So it's very, very interesting how, how that plays out. Uh, but yeah, the earlier point is that around around propaganda, that's where we've gotten so much pushback since 2020 after all the listening and one big recommendation that came out of the black community was let's teach history a little differently in this country. And the resounding answer has been no. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> like if we could just tell a little bit more, a more complex, thicker story, we love, we, we love our country, it's, but can we just teach history? Uh, I wrote an op-ed called Why We Talk Past Each Other when it comes to the issue of racism, and, and a part of it is that people don't know each other. One study was done that reported that about 7% of the black experience shows up in a public school education. So. Most white Americans, they know very little about, about African Americans, about our history, about our issues. So then you have all this public discourse around these issues, propaganda. Then it's easy to just go with tropes and caricatures because people don't, they don't know their neighbors. They, they don't know their, you know, their, their history. And it's why platforms and opportunities like this are so important because it gives us opportunity to kind of have some some in-depth discussions. Yes? Yeah, well I have a question. Coretta Scott King, Martin Luther King, I'm curious as to whether or not they were both on the same page when they had gotten together or was one more radical than the other and by the time King was radicalizing, um, where was Coretta Scott King? Was she oh. more radical or was she catching up? So I'm, I'm curious with their development. That's something I'm really interested in. Uh, I, I would like to look into to, to really tease that out. I think his assassination, of, of course, was a, a huge factor in changing the trajectory of her work because then a big part of her work is going to now revolve around honoring King, con continuing his legacy, and, and the movement had so fundamentally shifted after his, his assassination. He came big with the anti-Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. Marcus the movement, yeah. yeah. One of the things I got uh, when I taught uh, King's classes, one of my students, uh, and it was, 
it was current students as well as auditors in the community because I always, when I teach, I love opening my classes up to, uh, <coughs> to people in the community. And one of my students gifted me with the program for, for Dr. King's funeral. <laughs> and, uh, and it's, yeah, it, it, it's a tremendous gift. And as I was looking through the program and you could see who was doing what during the, uh, the funeral, there is an excerpt in, uh, in the, you know, you have these church programs. There's an excerpt from Dr. King's uh, I Have a Dream speech. And it mentions that quote. <laughs> I have a dream that my poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin. So the, the King family has a complicated role in that. And black, black study scholars, there's some criticism around, you know, what the King family did with, with, with King's legacy. Uh, I've just always been told by senior black scholars back when I was a, a junior scholar, be very careful uh, with the uh, King family, they don't play with his, with his legacy, they will sue. That's, that's, what, that's what I was told. Uh, so it's kind of, you have to tread lightly uh, on some of those issues. But it would be interesting to kind of see how that plays itself out in, you know, in the, in the trajectory of her thing. I think she was probably just as radical, but then after his assassination, there's a need to just be more, more, more magnanimous and optimistic.
And if we don't make those important kind of changes, then you know, we're only going to hurt ourselves. So I really applaud uh, your courage uh, and, and, being, and being a trailblazer. And uh, we're, we're, we're in the classroom doing, doing that important hard work. I love having uh, my students read uh, Kelly Brown Douglas, uh, who wrote a book on sexuality in black church. And she, she wrote that book because of how one of her friends who died from AIDS was being treated by a black congregation. And it showed just all the complexity around trying to talk about sexuality. <laughs> you know, just how complicated that is. So she does some great, great work, and I love uh, you know, drawing on her work as well. I'd love to talk more with you. No, I'll, sure, I love that. <laughs> yes, yes, let's make that happen. Are there any other questions, comments? Oh, two more. One back here and one up here. You mentioned the backlash that happens whenever there's progress, and historically it's so clear that it's happened. But most of society doesn't recognize the backlash. And so while it's going on, they just think, oh, this is the normal thing. How can we frame historically the backlash as we've made progress so that we don't just not backslide, but we recognize it for what it is, which is backlash, and it's bad actors behaving badly, and we don't get to call it that, or it's not as clear to somebody who doesn't have the full perspective. Is it just being able to? I, I, I hear more of this topic in Africana studies and that, looking through that lens. Yeah. But it should be in U.S. history. It should be in yes. every lens. And I'm just wondering how we can present this topic better so that people understand this. The other question became, how are we teaching the history to include that perspective? So people, when we see progress, are bracing themselves and on the lookout for the backlash to prevent it. It's one of the great terms you get in, in, in black studies, you know, you, there, because it, it's, there's so much careful attention to history and always paying attention to those moments of, of breakthrough and then just pretty much systematically seeing what happens when there, you, you get these moments of breakthrough. So that term is very, very helpful. I do a lot of lectures on the issue of reparations and one time I, I did a series of lectures in white churches on it. And so you can imagine teaching in an all-white church on the issue of reparations. And there's all of this. That word just invokes like, okay, if they can just sit through, sit through a lecture and, and, and hear me out. And I've done this multiple times. By the time I finish my third lecture, there's not a, I've never seen a person that having gone through that says, I'm opposed to it. They're like, no, we need to do it. It's just the word sets them off. So a lot of times they're like, is there a different word you could use that would maybe be more palatable for, for white Americans? And, and I'm like, you know, yeah, I, you know, I, can, I can come up with a lot of words. I have a PhD, I can make up words. Uh, but will it, will it, have any traction. So I think the whole term of backlash, I think approaching that from a descriptive standpoint, I found to be very, very effective. So talking about what happened in this country after Obama was elected. Yeah. And for people to just kind of see, okay, you get the Tea Party. Immediately started. We're taking our country back. All right. And before you ever get to a MAGA, there's you get the tea party, and then you start seeing these white nationalist groups starting to kind of come out the closet, and, and people feeling uh, emboldened. So describing it has been much more effective in like op-eds, different articles, than dropping that term. If I use that term, then people feel a little defensive, they, they, they feel attacked, and then that, that kind of shuts things down. Uh, and so we, we saw the exact same things in 2020. Breakthroughs then you get the pushback. Question over here. Hi, thank you for being here today. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so I have a question. Um, I'm curious to see your perspective on the question of is, uh, is negative stereotyping of black Americans by white Americans an Say it, say it one more time for me. Say it real loud. Okay. Loud. Okay. So um, I'm curious to see your perspective on Stereotyping of black Americans, like 
Is it avoidable? Well, yeah, yeah. She's asking pretty much um, the negative perception of blacks that others tend to have, including the white community. And is that something that's going to be inevitable and just happen, or do you see, you know, changes? Is that what you want? Yeah. Okay. Great question. And it kind of goes back to the, the point uh, I, I made with the dean. I'm talking about, okay, how do, um, when it comes to, to this whole issue of, of backlash, how do we do something constructive with that so that we just don't keep seeing the, the, the repetition of the cycle? So language is very, very important. So one of the things I like to do is instead of talking about the world or talking about this country, I like using the language of, uh, of a neighborhood and thinking about people in terms of being your neighbors. Because sometimes that helps to lower people's defenses. As long as when you can other someone, put them in a category, they're not me, they're not close to me, then it becomes easy to have all kinds of pejorative, stereotypical beliefs about, about them, you don't get to know them. But the language of a, of a neighbor, that's a more intimate kind of image. And to think about the world as a neighborhood, and even people who are different, they are still your neighbors. And don't you want to get to know your neighbors? Well, that's a different approach to talking about the importance of learning other people's history than saying, we need CRT in. OK, you say that, and in, in some places, that's going to shut down the conversation. But it's like, okay, you have neighbors who are different. Wouldn't you like to learn, you know, about their history? And I've found people to be a little bit more open. Yeah, I don't have anything. But once we use some of these hot button terms, that becomes a problem. So in our our, our political discourse, we, we, we have to be as as leaders, as scholars, very, very uh, we have to study political discourse in how words and terms are being used because you know, we're the folks that have context on this stuff. We can kind of go back and, and understand and, and, and explore ways to kind of redirect some of that. Now, I think, yes, it is inevitable because humans have a problem with difference. That, it's just, that's a human problem. It's a human problem. But it, but it has acute manifestations in this country. <laughs> yes? I was just sorry. I was just saying that I feel like media plays a huge role in how we perceive stereotypes and stuff like that. Yes. From us being aggressive, from the Jezebel, from the Miami. Like those are things that we see so prevalently in like social media, from like news articles being like you only see the, the worst from us. Like I feel like slowly but surely it can get better, but it's all about like having representation in those fields so that we are able to put our best selves out there as well. Oh, I love that point because the one of the unfortunate side effects of desegregation was the loss of, of our institutions. Black community, you know, we had our banking institutions, our own insurance institutions, we had our own sports leagues, we gave all of those institutions that protected our community up to, because here's, here's integration. White America says, okay, we'll dismantle all your institutions, we'll take the, pretty much the most talented of you, you can come into white space, and then we're gonna leave 90 plus percent of your community completely disenfranchised. 1865, when the black community came out of slavery, we had 2.6% of the wealth. Guess how much wealth we have today? We have the same amount of wealth we had when we came out of slavery. And by 2054, we will be at zero wealth as a people. So, this is why King, in his later years, started arguing that we need to segregate ourselves until America is ready for real integration. Now, 
That's another part of his thought that, that has been lost. This is why the whole push back to HBCUs is, is starting to happen. We have to also think about, because we, we had black press, we had our own uh, newspapers, we had our own media outlets where we weren't relying on other, other entities to tell us what was going on in our, in our own community. So how do we, as a community, and I don't, and we can never completely desegregate, our, segregate ourselves from, from like institutions. We don't have enough black organizations and entities for all uh, black Americans, but we do have to fortify the institutions and the organizations that are working on the front lines in black communities. Because as long as all the talent keeps leaving our communities uh, and not supporting our communities, we'll continue to be uh, marginalized and displaced. So it's kind of good to hear your passion around the, the, the whole media piece. Social media has helped with some of that, but it's also, we, we need something a little stronger. Okay, thank you.